Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and I thank you for your word. I thank you that the entrance of your word gives us life, and it gives us understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. So tonight we're going to talk about turning a setback into a comeback. How do you turn a setback into a comeback? Let's look at some people who did. Can we, do we have the, there we go, Steve Jobs, okay? Um, most of us know who he was. He, he um, co-founded Apple at age of 21 and was worth millions by age 23. He uh, recruited an experienced Fortune 500 CEO, John Scully, and three years later, Scully fired him. He didn't see it then, but it turned out that getting fired from Apple was the best thing that could have ever happened to him. Jobs said in 2005, he started his second company, NEXT, which ultimately acquired by Apple, and Jobs became CEO again. And uh, I am reading this on an iPad, so obviously he did well. Amen? Next person, USS Grant, one of our president, the president after... Um, Andrew Johnson, who took Lincoln's place after he was assassinated. He was the 18th president. He saved the Union during the Civil War, but he led a life full of highs and lows. He was a West Point graduate. He left the Army after being accused of drinking on duty. Then he struggled for seven years, barely able to support his family. When war broke out, Grant went back into the Army, first as a volunteer, then as a colonel, and eventually as a top U.S. general. And then he was elected president, but he later burned through his money. He was flat out broke and ultimately had to write his memoirs on his deathbed in order to provide for his family. And who was the publisher? Mark Twain. Mark Twain, or Samuel Clemens, uh, what's his Samuel Clemens, is that his name? Okay. Um, he was one of the greatest American writers, and Twain made some bad, bad business decisions and had some unlucky investments. He was broke and bankrupt by 1894, 20 years after he became super famous as the author of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. He moved his family to Europe, went on a grueling speaking tour, and wrote prolifically. Ultimately, he made enough money to restore his fortune and repay all his creditors, even though his debts had legally been discharged in bankruptcy. Sadly, Twain later suffered more tragedy and fell into a deep depression after the death of his wife and two daughters. Next, Martha Stewart, okay. Martha was the founder of her own company that bears her name. She was America's first self-made billionaire, female, female billionaire, first one. Five years after her company went public, Stewart went to prison for a conspiracy as a part of the Imclone stock case. And then she went gently into that good night. No, she didn't. What happened? She went into prison. She got out of prison, and then she launched her compact com campaign as soon as she was released. Her company became profitable within one year, and she rejoined its board of directors in 2011, and she currently serves as the chairman. Pretty cool, huh? Do you know who this girl is? Some of you older people might know. Dorothy Hamill. <laughs> anyway, she, oh man, if you can watch a YouTube of her skating, she was an amazing skater. Amazing, especially back then. Um, in 1976, she won the gold, and uh, she then got a $1 million a year income as a professional for performer skating. But after years of excessive spending, uh, she, um, which included buying jewelry and making bad investments, and she had purchased the ice capades. Uh, she filed for bankruptcy in 1996. She worked hard to come back, and um, she did. She went, she kept skating, went on television, and sold a memoir. And a few la years later, she was in the movie Blades of Glory with Will Ferrell. 
so she made a comeback. James Altucher, uh, most of you probably don't even know who this guy is, but I read his book, and it's really good. So he was a guy, he founded a web design company and, uh, in 1966 and sold it two years later for $10 million. Then he lost everything in a series of bad investments a series of bad investments um, in 2000. He almost committed suicide as a result of that, and he eventually realized he couldn't judge his self-worth by his net worth. He made back his fortune as a hedge hunt manager and is now a super popular blogger and podcaster. Okay, do you know who this guy is? I bet you didn't know his name, though. Stanley Kirk Burrell, better known as MC Hammer, okay? He was really popular, right? Um, he had more than $50 million of, uh, of his records, um, but he still fell into debt. He filed for bankruptcy in 1996 and owed $13 million, okay? But he rebounded, and uh, he became an entrepreneur. He launched record labels, invested in tech startups, gave lectures and did TV appearances, and he also has become a Christian speaker and has slowly rebuilt his music career. This guy, that's the old, 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 old Mickey. Okay, Walt Disney. Okay, his first company was an animation and film studio in Kansas City, city that went belly up in 1922. And uh, he moved out to Carol California for his next venture, which was Disney Brothers Studio. And uh, obviously it did a little bit better. He created Mickey Mouse in 1928 and has gone on from there. This guy, we all know this guy, a champ, right? George Foreman, he was an Olympic gold medalist and twice won the title of world heavyweight champion. Won at 45 years old after coming out of retirement in 1994. So um, in the years followed, uh, Foreman didn't quite go bankrupt, but he almost did. He called it a close call. And uh, he squandered uh, $5 million and he lend did his name to the people that created the George Foreman Grill, and it earned him $200 million. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm trying to get you people from all different kind of avenues so that you can see that, you know, it, it, and different situations. Like with James Altucher, you know, he, he almost committed suicide, okay? And how many times do we have setbacks and people, the thought runs through people's minds, or even maybe they attempt to commit suicide over a setback that they had, or that um, you know they're in drugs or whatever, and they just feel like they can't come out. Um, Willie Nelson, he had uh, 68 studio albums, 30 of which received gold or platinum status, but he ran into tax problems. Um, uh, he owed the IRS $32 million because his accountants didn't pay his taxes properly. And he worked hard and recorded, recorded an album and did commercials, including one for H&R Block, which made fun of his problems. He ultimately paid off his debts, and he's been recording and touring ever since. He's probably even more popular now than he was then. Okay, next one is Cindy Lauper, uh, you know, the girls just wanna have fun song, if, for those of you who might know that song. Anyway, in the 1980s, she had a whole bunch of hits, and um, she was part of a band that was called Blue Angel that had so little financial success that she had to file bankruptcy. She recovered recorded songs, topped the charts, and became something of an icon. And most recently, in 2013, she won a Tony Award for the score she wrote for a Broadway musical called Kinky Boots. Uh, and she's been inaugurated into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. 
Pretty cool, huh? One more. Robert Downey Jr. Okay, yeah. Iron Man, right? Sherlock Holmes. Okay, this guy, okay, he won at an early age, won an Academy Award. He had an Academy Award nomination in 1992 for the film Chaplin. But between 96 and 2001, he was arrested many times on drug-related charges. His set setbacks led to probation, jail time, and court-ordered drug rehabilitation. After five years of setbacks, he decided to have a comeback. He now has, we, we all know who he is. Why? Because he came back from doing drugs. Now, these people did it without God. We have God, all right? So we may have a setback in our life, and, and you know, a setback is a setback. You may not be, have had a setback that was worth millions of dollars, or you may not have been arrested a multitude of times because of drug-related charges or something like that, but we all have setbacks. We all have the sin that so easily besets us, okay? What, no matter what it is. And that was the thing that really spurred me on to be thinking about this because I, I, um, I was thinking about this uh, last month. And uh, I thought about people who backslide and, and how difficult it is to get out of that bucket once you go down. Now, the same principles apply whether it's spiritual or whether it's natural, the setbacks that you have in life, okay? And it takes a lot to come back and to make a decision to come back. All of those people made a decision to come back. The thing that plagues us, that keeps us from making a comeback, is the thoughts in our head that ring that say, you're not going to come back, you can't come back, you're never going to get out of the hole, this is the way it's going to be for the rest of your life. You made this mistake, now you're going to have to make your bed and stay there. No, that's a lie. Because why? Because God's the God of fresh start. Okay? What, is, what does 2 Corinthians 5, 17 say? If any man is in Christ, he is a what? A new creation. Old things are passed away, behold, all things new. But you know what? That's every day. That's every day. He gives us fresh starts every day. Let's look at Luke 15. Luke 15 and verse 1, it says, Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such despicable people, even eating with them. So Jesus used this illustration. If you had 100 sheep and one of them strayed away and was lost in the wilderness, wouldn't you leave the 99 others to go and search for the lost one until you found it? I just want to pause there for a minute. He's talking about sheep. Now, this could be um, that are in his fold. Lots of times we always associate this with going after lost people, and yes, it pertains, it, it can. But this is talking about people, to me, in, in this situation, especially we're talking about tonight, people that you know had a greater revelation. Maybe they're not completely backslidden, but maybe you, you find about people, Rob and I are finding about different ministers all the time that are letting go of the gifts of the Spirit. Uh, won't teach faith anymore. Don't believe in prosperity. Just different things like that. Letting it go because it's not popular or, you know, those kind of things. Now, um, so we all have areas in our life where, you know, we kind of, we go astray. Some of us, it's more evident than others, okay? So we have a revelation, we've been walking in it, and all of a sudden, boom. Or we've been walking with God. We've been walking with God, we've been walking with God, we've been walking with God, and then all of a sudden, we have this setback. One little setback after another little setback, after another little setback, after another little setback. And before we know it, we're not thinking the way that we should. We're not acting the way that we should. And so here, Jesus says, if you had a hundred sheep and one of them strayed away and was lost in the wilderness, wouldn't you leave the 99 others to go and search for the lost one until you found it? That's what God does with us. 
Man, he's going after us. And then it says, and then you would joyfully carry it home on your shoulders. When you arrived, you would call together your friends and neighbors to rejoice with you because your lost sheep was found. Remember, it's part of the family. In the same way, heaven will be happier over one lost sinner who returns to God than over 99 others who are righteous and haven't strayed away. Or suppose a woman has 10 valuable silver coins and loses one. Won't she light a lamp and look in every corner of the house and sweep every nook and cranny until she finds it? And when she finds it, she will call in her friends and neighbors to rejoice with her because she has found her lost coin. In the same way, there is joy in the presence of God's angels when even one sinner repents. To illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now instead of waiting until you die. So his father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and took a trip to a distant land, and there he wasted all his money on wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him to feed his pigs. The boy became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him, but no one gave him anything. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, at home, even the hired men have food enough to spare, and here I am, dying of hungry, hunger. You know, let me just stop and say this. You know, when, when, when we backslide, we, eat, we live off our fat for a while. When we choose not to believe the word of God, maybe the way that we did, let's not even talk about backsliding. Let's just talk about not standing on the word of God the way we maybe did at one point in our life. So for a while what happens is, is we live off the fat. But you can only live off the fat for as long as there is fat. You know, I mean, if, if uh, somebody uh, is... It doesn't matter if they're overweight or not, but if they choose not to eat, there's only so much fat in your body that you can live off of until you waste away to nothing. Isn't that right? Yeah. And so that's the way this is in this situation. So, you know, we don't experience necessarily the, um, the uh, what do you call it, consequences of moving in the wrong direction immediately okay and, and then all of a sudden it becomes a setback like with him it's a setback for him now he's like whoa i don't even have i don't have any money i don't have any food to eat. i don't have any food to eat man my my dad's servants eat better than me i should just go and be one of my dad's servants and so uh in verse 18, it says, I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired man. So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long distance away, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Let me just stop here for a second. I want to go back to the eating off the fat thing. You know, there was a time maybe where you were spending more time with God. Maybe you were studying the word of God more. Maybe you were worshiping more, whatever it is, confessing the word more, that kind of thing. You had a, a, a greater relationship. And then things got in the way. You know, we get busy. And then we don't spend as much time with the Lord as, as we did previously. Okay, and so then we begin to eat off, we uh, begin to live off a little bit of our fat, and we're doing okay, and, and you know, we haven't gone on a starvation diet, so we're still getting some in and everything like that, but we're not as strong and healthy as we were, okay, and so that's why it's important to um, just keep up with all of that and just continually go to God. I have to, I have to uh, and this isn't me, I do this all the time because I, I, I've been at these places myself just like everybody else has um, where, uh, you know, I think I'm doing okay and actually I'm really not doing okay. I'm, I'm 
deceiving myself because the Bible says that when we're not doing the word, we deceive ourselves. We're self-deceived. We're blinded. We don't, we, somebody could try to express it to us, but we just don't see it because we're blinded and we're living off our fat until all of a sudden the bottom falls out and we go, whoa, we try to exercise our faith and we can't because we haven't been developing it. So it says, in verse 21, he said, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet. And kill the calf we have been fattening in the pen. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working when he returned home. He heard music and dancing in the house. He asked one of the servants, what was going on? Your brother's back, he was told, and your father has killed the calf we were fattening and has prepared a great feast. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. But he replied, all these years I've worked hard for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the finest calf, calf we have. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you and I are very close and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day, for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So what did the father do right away? The father forgave him. Isn't that what God does with us? He's given us a robe of righteousness. So what did, what did the father do? The father wanted him to know, you know what, son? What you did was wrong. And so for every one of us, anytime we sin, if we've gone down the tubes in some way, if you're watching and you've gone down the tubes and you, you're having a hard time coming back, the way back is knowing who you are in Christ. The way back is wearing that robe of righteousness that you were given when you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. It wasn't based on what you do. It's based totally on your relationship with God that you made Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. You're righteous, not because of your works. You're righteous because of who you are in him, who God made you to be in him. Okay, so if don't think um, uh, God is any different for us. This is the way God treats every single one of us. When we fall, he's there to pick us back up. When we run away and we come back, he's there with open arms telling us, yes, I love you. You're my child. I'm so glad you've come back. And it's something we have to keep in mind because we allow the negative thoughts, we allow the thoughts of, I just blew it so bad. Man, you know, I got drunk again. I had sex again. I, I did drugs again. I had a bad attitude again. Whatever it is, no matter how... You know, we, we measure sin, but to God, there is no measurement. Whatever it is that you just keep going down, keep falling, the thing that keeps making you fall all the time that gets you so discouraged. Let God embrace you. Put on that robe of righteousness. Stand tall. Know who you are, who he made you to be, because then you can walk it out with him. In Luke 17, 4, it says, If he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you, saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Why is it that we think to ourselves, God can't forgive me for what I've done? No matter how big or how small it may seem, we, it, whether we've walked away from him for a while or whether we've walked away from him for five minutes, how many times a day does he forgive us? And that we need to receive that forgiveness instead of getting beat down, get beat down, beat down because of a setback that we've had. Um, in 1 John 1, 5, the first thing you have to do to come back is acknowledge your sin. You can't have a comeback if you don't acknowledge that you need one. 
whether it's sin or whether it's a, a setback on, on the job or wherever it is, you have to acknowledge what went wrong first. Where was the mistake? Okay, there was a mistake. There was something that happened. So acknowledge that. Look at that. In 1 John 1, 5, it says, This is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So first we have to acknowledge our sin in order to come back. Then the next thing we need to do is to get back up. You know, how many times do you watch a baby? I love watching Babies walk, begin to walk. You know, I just, they're, it's so excited. They're like, I, I, I wonder what they're thinking on the inside. Hey, everybody, look, I'm standing. <laughs> big deal. It's a big deal, isn't it? I mean, after laying on your back for a year, <laughs> you know, for most of them, it's like, whoa, look at this. I'm, I'm upright like you are because they can crawl, but to be upright and standing on their own, big deal. And then to take the plunge, that step. And what happens most of the time? Boom, they're down. Thank God for diapers, right? <laughs> but do they stop? They get right back up. They get right back up all the time. They just get right back up. They're, they're like, no. I am determined to walk like my parents do and all these other people I see. I'm not, I'm not going to be satisfied with looking at legs and feet for the rest of my life. <laughs> and that's what we have to decide in our brain. Are, are we going to, do we want to live in the gutter? The gutter, you know, in our mind? Do we want to live there? No, we, do, we don't want to live there. So in Proverbs 24, 16, it says, No matter how many times you trip them up, God-loyal people don't stay down long. Soon they're up on their feet, while the wicked end up flat on their faces. In the New King James Version, it says, For a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. And then in Revelation 2, 5, this is such a cool verse. And uh, it's a CJB translation. I don't know what that stands for but anyway therefore remember where you were before you fell and turn from the sin and do what you used to do before because think about it when you fall do you go all the way back to where you were started no you get up right where you were and then you keep moving forward isn't that right so he says remember where you were and keep moving from there right how were you before? What were the things that you did before? Well, you know, you, you worshiped God and you spent time with God and whatever you did, you know, you just did it. I, you know, I've even examined, uh, I, I examined myself uh, uh, because I wasn't as happy as I was at one time and I wasn't as lighthearted and everything. Rob married me because I was fun. I made him laugh because he lived in a home there that didn't happen. And, you know, life has a way of taking that away from you. And I just went, wait a second. Uh, this has to stop. And uh, I need to you know, I'd look at kids and see how happy they were and just lighthearted and everything like that. And I'd be like, that's the way God wants me to be. And so I'm working on it. I'm working on it just so that I can just be more upbeat and happy and be who I am instead of letting life take that away from me. So that's a setback. Maybe not a setback like you think, but it, it's still it's it's a setback. So I'm coming back, and I'm going to keep moving forward. Amen. Okay. So then, what's the next thing we need to do? We need to 
forget about it. Okay, forget about it. Psalm 103, 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Hebrews 8, 12 and Hebrews 10, 17 say this, For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and iniquities. I will remember no more. Uh, 10, 17 says, Their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. So if God doesn't remember them anymore, then I need to quit bringing them up myself. Okay? So we got to forget about it. Then what else do we need to do? Um, We have to rely on God's word. Because if we don't rely on God's word, we're just going to fall. We need a foundation for coming back. And that's not just a spiritual comeback that is in any area of our life. We have to have something that we can hold on to that keeps us going strong. The word of God is always going to be our strength and our deliverer. In Psalm 119, 133, it says, Guide my steps by your word so I will not be overcome by any evil. Psalm 119, 9 says, How can a young person stay pure? By obeying your word and following its rules. I have tried my best to find you. Don't let me wander from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. What's the thing that keeps us from perpetual, you know, just the same sin, same sin, same sin, same sin, same sin? It's by hiding God's word in our heart. What keeps us pure? You know, it doesn't matter how old you are, you can still be pure in your thought. Amen? What keeps us pure? By taking heed according to his word and hiding it in our heart. Um. Okay, when we want to make a comeback, we need to get godly counsel. Godly counsel, okay? So it'll line up with the word of God. In Ecclesiastes 9, 16, in the New King James, it says, Then I said, Wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. Words of the wise spoken quietly should be heard rather than the shout of a ruler of fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war. But one sinner destroys much good. And what is the beginning of wisdom? The fear of the Lord. In the New Living, in verse 18, it says, A wise person can overcome weapons of war, but one sinner can destroy much that is good. When we walk on God's word, we can destroy those weapons that have been raged against us, because we all have weapons, you know, in 2 Corinthians, it says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. When there's thoughts that come through our mind that are contrary to God's word, and we just got to take it, get rid of it, get rid of it, get rid of it. I'm constantly, I have to constantly tell myself to do that. Constantly telling myself to do that. No, stop thinking about that, Linda. Um, you know, in the past, something that I used to do to keep myself from eating the wrong things, I used to slap my hands. I used to go, Linda, no. And then I'd slap my face. I'd say, no, you're not eating that. Do you understand me? <laughs> but that's the same kind of thing that we should do in our mind. No, no, you're not going to think that way. You get that thought out of your mind. You're going to think this way. You see? No. You remember when your parents, you you know, used to do that? No. No child of mine does that. Do you understand me? Okay. Yeah. Got it. Um, Then in Psalm 1, it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the word of God, and in the word of God does he meditate day and night. And he is like a tree planted by the rivers of living water who yields his fruit in his season. His leaf doesn't wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. So first we walk in the counsel of the godly. It says, and then don't stand in the way of sinners. That means that we aren't hanging around with. That doesn't mean that you don't know people that are not Christians and that you can never be with them. It means they're not the people you hang around with the most, okay? You don't hang around with them a lot because you need to, you're blessed 
when you're with the godly. That's what that first thing said. And it says, and don't stand in the way of sinners. And then it says, don't sit in the seat of the scornful. In other words, don't hang around with people that are disrespectful. You got people that are being disrespectful toward other people, talking negatively, you know, even talking negatively about our authorities. Years ago, when President Clinton went through all that stuff, Rob and I just uh, actually when right when he first became president, you know, we weren't excited uh, at that time with the result. But we knew what the Word of God said. The Word of God said we were to pray for those that were in authority over us. So we didn't speak negatively about President Clinton because the Word of God tells us that we were to respect him for the office that he holds. Amen? Amen. And so we didn't. And we haven't ever since. We don't talk negatively about those that are in authority over us. But do you talk negatively about your boss? Do you talk negatively about, you know, your parents if you're a kid and you're living at home or something like that? Or whoever, you know, uh, uh, even to talk negatively about Pastor Rob. Is he perfect? No. But it's not for us to judge anybody, actually, because we're all kings and priests. Isn't that right? So it's not for us to talk negatively about anybody or be disrespectful towards anybody because the Bible says that we're to respect all people. All people, it doesn't matter what color they are doesn't matter what they believe. We're to respect people because they're made in the image and likeness of God. Then, Ecclesiastes um, 10.4, we don't want to quit. We need to have a calm disposition. Uh, Ecclesiastes 10.4 says, if your boss is angry with you, don't quit. A quiet spirit can overcome even great mistakes. Galatians 6, 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man sows, that shall he reap. He that sows to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that sows to the Spirit shall reap everlasting life. Let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due time we'll reap if we don't faint. Don't give up. Spend time in prayer. Luke twenty two forty 40 says, Jesus said, um, there they were in the garden, <clears throat> and the disciples were falling asleep. And Jesus says, pray that you will not be overcome by temptation. Because you can't be in prayer and then sin. The two things won't go together. Amen? Um, Jesus, in Luke 18, 1, it says, Jesus told them a story showing that it was necessary for them to pray consistently and to never quit. (coughs) I'm just going to give you my points because I have to be done now, but um, focus on who God made you to be in Christ. Get help and help others who have fallen because it's sowing and reaping. When we help others, it helps us not to fall. Keep in mind that Jesus already came it for you, overcame it for you. In John 16, 33, it says, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. And there's many more like that. So if you've been in a place where, man, you just felt like you were in a hole and you just couldn't get out, There's help right here. And I'm going to just pray for all of us right now that we'll get, we'll overcome in that area, that setback, that thing that's just constantly on us all the time. Keeps coming up. Keeps coming up. You're like, whoa, I thought I got rid of that. What happened? No, it keeps coming up. We keep backing up. So let's, Let me just pray for you all. 
Father, each one of us have had setbacks in our life. I pray that each person here and is in the sound of my voice would realize that they have hope in you and that they can come back from that setback. But just as those lost people, people that don't know you came back from situations that they had great setbacks in, how that we can do it so much more in you. Holy Spirit, I pray right now that you give each one a scripture that they can hold on to that will help them get out of the bucket of their thinking and move forward in the grace that they have in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. Amen? Hallelujah. And I just want to encourage you, too, that and for those of you who are watching it, if you don't pray in the Holy Ghost, pray in the Holy Ghost. Because the Bible says, building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, it'll keep you in the love of God. But it's something that builds you up. It's something God gave us. If you've never been filled with the Holy Spirit and you'd like to be filled with the Holy Spirit, um, you know, just come on, come on down at the end of service here and, and we'll pray for you to receive the Holy Spirit. But if you don't pray in tongues and, and you did it one time, I want you to encourage you to rekindle that. You need that strength. You need to be built up. And I pray in the Holy Ghost as many chances as I get. You know, in the car, I'm praying in the Holy Ghost all the time. While I'm doing my laundry, I'm praying in the Holy Ghost. It's just, I need it. If I don't do it, you know, I, I suffer. Amen? If you're watching online, you can call or... Um, I don't know if we have it on the FHC website. Uh, on there, I'm not sure if it's on there or not. But I, I encourage you to call and uh, tomorrow, and somebody will pray with you or give you some scriptures concerning.